If you will, turn with me in your Bibles this morning for our scripture reading. It's uh, found in Hebrews chapter 11. (coughs) Most of us understand Hebrews chapter 11 is the faith chapter. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. If you ever wanted to know what faith meant, there's your definition right there. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. We are uh, very privileged today to have a dear friend of mine speaking, um, Dan Beringer. And I've known Dan for a year and a half, two years, I don't know how long it's been, but... uh, it's been a privilege to get to know him, and those of you in the church that know Dan have been blessed by him as well. I didn't know Dan before he came to the church, but I've heard that um, he's uh, been through a lot of changes in his life, and he's been a tremendous encouragement to me, a strength to me, um, as we've had opportunities to study together, to pray together. He's been an active part of our, our small Bible study group. And I have seen him grow so close to the Lord, and I've seen the blessings that have been a result of that. And I think of a verse in the Bible that, when I think of Dan, I'd like to share it before I ask him to come up here. It's Romans chapter 12. The title is Living sacrifices to God. It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And when I think of my friend Dan, I think of that verse, and it's a verse that I've committed to memory And I would like to be more like that too, that we can prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God by the transforming of our our minds. So uh, I know a lot of us have looked forward to Dan speaking to us, and I don't want to take anything away from him, but I just uh, wanted to say a few words about him, what he's meant to me, and I know he's meant a lot to each of you. So, Dan, thank you. (laughs) Those were humbling words because I'm a chief sinner, <laughs> by all means. Um, so let us pray before we start. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for bringing us together again today. Uh, we know and you have promised that where two or more of us are gathered, you're here with us. Thank you for your presence here today. Please let me be your mouthpiece that uh, we all may be blessed today by your word and be able to act out your love. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, I have to apologize. I didn't get any of the information to Janet. (laughs) I'm fairly new to all of this as far as like the scripture reading. None of that's printed in the bulletin, nor is the title of the sermon. Um, I'm not really big on uh, titles, but if I had to title this, it would be Faith in the Faithless. And I'm referring to myself because there was one time where I didn't see any faith in me at all. You know, and I still struggle with that, but we'll get to that a little bit later. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about my time at Arise. I know a lot of people have asked me about that. Um, it's been about two. I've been back for about two months. Uh, next week will be two months. It doesn't seem that long. Um, if you would have asked me a year ago <laughs> if I would have married a girl that I've known since sixth grade and have three sons. <laughs> uh, quit a full-time job, and then went to a four-month evangelism school, I would have said, you're crazy. <laughs> There's no way that was going to happen in my life. Uh, stuff with me tends to happen. I get, you know, uh, Lillian, actually, we were in Bible study group, and she and I was t- we were talking about this and everything else, the group, and um, <clears throat> I was talking. I, was, I finally told them I, I've made my decision. I'm going to arise. She said you were convicted. I never thought of myself as being convicted of anything like that really you know with the exception of becoming a paramedic I knew then like it just hit me out one day that that's what I wanted to do so things happen with me fairly quickly once it once I start thinking about it I become convicted I've learned that word <laughs> and that's what happened with uh, a lot within the past year and within a very short amount of time 
uh, last year about this time, you, you know, I've been a paramedic for about going on 10 years. <clears throat> I really enjoyed that job. Um, I put a lot of time into it. Uh, for the last three years, you know, before I quit, I was a supervisor. I had eight people under me. Had a lot of issues with that, <laughs> you know. Um, I remember what was the final straw was I was sitting in my director's office with an employee that I was having some issues with. And I remember as we were, you know, having this discussion and, you know, a rise that came up and I'd been thinking about it for a couple months and been praying about it. And <clears throat> I remember sitting there as I was having this conversation with my director and this other employee that I was like, you know what, that's it, I'm done. I'm quitting, I'm going to a rise and I'm getting married. <laughs> All within a very short amount of time it happened. Um, and that's what happened. That's what I did. So um, that was in about that was May of last year. Uh, I put my notice in July. My last day of work full time was August 15th of last year. I left. Uh, I went to Oregon out there to arise on September 2nd. I'm a very homebody type person. I like home. I like my comfort zone. Uh, you know, I don't like stepping out of that. Like I'm very. I can. I like my alone time. I like. You know, standing in front of a group of people is just beyond me. <laughs> Um, so that, that's God, that's not me. Uh, but that's what we need to do. Uh, we need to step out of our comfort zones a lot of times because that's how we grow. Yeah, you know, and I'm, I'm thankful for the growth that you know, every now and then I catch a glimpse of it. And, you know, um, but anyway, I, I, I got out there to Oregon and Jasper. I had no idea what to expect. I didn't know how many people were going to be there. I didn't know who my roommate was going to be. You know, I hadn't had a roommate in years and I was not looking forward to that. <laughs> Uh, you know, not to mention leaving uh, my wife and boys, you know, my new wife and boys, you know, for four months. Matter, I, I was out in Oregon, out at our rise longer than I'd been married when we, you know, went out there. Um, so it, it was, it, it was a challenge because I, I really didn't want to go, but I knew that's where I wanted, that's where I needed to go, that's where God was calling me to go. So I went, and I want to thank all of you for your prayers. I want to thank you for your support. I couldn't have done it without you. Uh, you know, a lot of times, you know, I sit there and think about it. It's like, you know, people are praying for me back home, and I really, really appreciate that. Uh, not to mention the donations and everything else. You know, I, I really appreciate it. Um, so, <clears throat> Arise started. We had six hours of classes a day, Monday through Thursday. We had, you know, we, we were partnered with the church out there in Eugene that we would go out into the community and do outreach. We would go out for on, um, what day was it? We got on Wednesdays and Sundays, or Thursdays and, some, Thursdays and Sundays. We would go out into the community for several hours a night and just knock on doors. Trying to, we had a survey that we would give uh, with several questions and basically what it do is it would lead down to, would you like to have Bible studies? Uh, we had several people say yes, but they would never, we would never, be able to contact them again. They wouldn't call us back. They wouldn't answer the door. Uh, the whole 15 weeks I was there, I ended up with one study, which I was thankful for. Yeah, you know, uh, a lot of other people had blessings and everything. We were building up, and you know, I got surprised with a lot when I was out there. We were working towards evangelistic series that David Ashrick was putting on towards the end of the program. I didn't know that at the time, but that's what we were doing. And uh, so that it, it was a challenge when I first when. <laughs> When we first, our first day of outreach was like a couple weeks after I got out there, and I was dreading it. I don't, you know, a lot of people were dreading it. You know, I think it was maybe one out of the 40 of us that actually wanted to go out. Because, you know, I was sitting there thinking, these people are going to think I'm crazy. I'm right here at supper time. I mean, you know, what is it? Not to mention, you know, but the one good thing about Eugene is like the hippie capital of America. You know, they, they're very open-minded, a lot of health-conscious people. There's a lot of vegetarian and a lot of vegan restaurants. They're very, very health-minded people. Uh, very nice. We got, I never, me and my outreach partner, his name was uh, Ronnie Rambo. I always called, we always referred to him as Rambo. It was just easier. And he, him and his family were out there. And he's from actually Maryland. And uh, <laughs> we never got doors slammed in, our, slammed in our face or got cussed at that I remember. Now, some of us did, but everybody kept going out. A lot of times, you know, towards the end, uh, everybody had Bible studies. A lot of people, you know, on outreach nights, we would go get Bible studies, or they would go get Bible studies. Um, I only let out in one, like I said, and her, her name was Denise, or is Denise. Uh, but she was so excited, you know, and I was nervous. I didn't know what I was doing. I was actually on the Word of God study, and I was preaching, was preaching <laughs> talking about Daniel 2, and basically saying the Word of God is true. You can trust it. 
it tells the future. And she was very excited and everything else. I was hoping to get to study with her again, but I never heard anything else from her. So that's the way it goes. So the Holy Spirit's there, the seed's been planted, and that's what I've learned. You just plant seeds. And, you know, and, and you don't try to, don't, I, I try not to sweat myself about it because if I do, it drives me crazy because I'm a perfectionist when it comes to some things. Uh, and so anyway, back to, we would have, you know, six hours of class a day. Uh, Fridays would be pretty much a preparation day. We would have off every now and then. We would have classes then too. Uh, Sundays, outreach started at 2 and ended at like 7 that night. Uh, anyway, it was a challenge nonetheless at some point in time. Sometimes I really wanted to come home. Um, stuff was happening within the family and everything else that I needed to be home. There was one time where I was close to coming home. And <laughs> it was actually the time that my wife flew out there and surprised me, which I had no idea about. And if, it, if I'd have had my own income coming in at that point in time, I would have never told her I was coming home. We would have missed each other. <laughs> so the Lord worked all that out. And, you know, she's like, I was going to think you didn't want me to see it. I was like, no, nah, that's not it. But um, So what <laughs> I got surprised with a lot of things, like I said out there. And one was a sermon. We had to do a 10-minute sermon in front of... Two of our instructors, our instructors were David Asherick, James Rafferty, Ty Gibson, and Jeffrey Rosario. They're all very different when it comes to, you know, their personal lives. Uh, you know, David, very fast talker. He's no different than what you see him on TV. What you see is what you get. James uh, is very personable. I mean, he's one that he came and knocked on my door asking me if I wanted to talk one night, sat there and talked to me for two hours. Uh, Ty can tell a story and paint a picture like you couldn't believe. Yeah, you know, if anybody's ever seen him on 3ABN, and you know, I haven't, I haven't watched him. I didn't even know any of these guys when I went out there. I didn't know who they were, except Phyllis would get excited about him every now and then. Uh, so, but you know, it was a blessing. And Jeffrey, he's the younger guy. He's, uh, he, you know, found Christ when he was 17. He was a high school dropout, and he's been all over the world preaching the gospel. You know, and everything these guys did and everything they, they preached about always pointed back to God's love. And the biggest thing that I, I took from there is that regardless of, what I, what, regardless of where or what I'm reading in the Bible, God's love is in everything. Every single thing. It doesn't matter if it's the bad stuff that everybody talks about in the Old Testament. God's mercy is in it. Somehow, some way, if you look for it, it's there. You have to look for it. You have to open up your heart and your mind, but it's there. It, even, it, you know, just everything about it, even the, the stonings, the, uh, you know, all of that. It's, God's love is there and his mercy is there somehow, some way. Which, you know, is a different view of God than what I grew up with. I grew up Adventist. Uh, you know, when I first started going back to church and started searching for God again, it was a couple of years ago. Um, I didn't really know that much about God, love, you know, God's love. You know, it was more of a legalistic view. Uh, you have to do this, you have to do that, and everything else, which, you know, works are important, but, you know, it means nothing if it doesn't point back towards Jesus and his love. And if you're not looking, if you're not portraying that, you know, it's pointless. If you're not doing that out of your heart, then, uh, you know, to me, it, it doesn't, it's just basically, it's, you know, it's not genuine. Um, but anyway, back to the sermon, you know, faith in the faithless. I was, you know, we got surprised and all of a sudden we had to preach a 10-minute sermon and it was going to be critiqued by two of these instructors. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> you know, and I don't like talking in front of people anyway. Uh, let alone my entire class who I've been with for months. Uh, you know, it's different talking in front of people that you know because they see your faults. They know if you're being genuine or not when you're sitting there, and, you know, you're talking with them and trying to show God's love and they've lived with you for three and a half months, uh, you know, because everybody had faults. You started seeing, you know, people started butting heads, people, arguments started happening, you, you know, I mean, we're at an evangelism school, God's there, but the devil's working just as hard, uh, you know. Um, so anyway, I was laying there and I was sitting there trying to think of what I could preach about and it hit me that, you know, we all have faith. Faith is the for, right? you know, the evidence of things not seen. We... You know, I think I struggle, and I think a lot of people struggle with the amount of faith we have. My faith goes up and down. It's like a roller coaster. You know, one week's fine, one day's fine. Two minutes ago was okay, and now two minutes later, it's just, I'm, you know, wondering, like, what am I doing? <laughs> um, but, you, you know, you look back in the Bible at all these biblical greats, like Noah, you know, all the way back to, like, Crater Roll and talking about Noah. But look at the faith that this man had. 
These people hadn't even heard of rain, and he's building an ark. Years, for years, he's building this, persecuted every day by these people thinking he's crazy. Hey, you know, I don't like being persecuted for five minutes, let alone years, and he kept on going. You know, eight people. Hey, you know, the eight people out of the entire world. And he kept going because he had faith in God's word and God's promises. Uh, you know, David fighting Goliath. You know, I like this. I like the simple stories. You know, I understand those. Those are why they're in the Bible. You know, um, there's a reason why we learn those as kids. I think we still need to concentrate on them when we get older. Prophecy is important and everything else. And you know, those those core stories are very very important. Um, you know, one thing that I learned that I thought was cool. You know, you sing that song. You know, uh, David and the five little stones that he took. Does anybody know know why he carried five stones? Besides you, Gabe. I know you, I know, you know. <laughs> yeah, he answered this last week at Albemarle for me. Uh, Goliath, had, Goliath had four brothers. David went out prepared to kill four other people besides Goliath. Yeah, you know, I couldn't imagine standing there looking at a giant with a sling in my hand and you know, probably Keelan's age or a 12-year-old or a 13-year-old, however, however old David was, going to kill a giant. you imagine the faith? that that took to be able to do that I, I mean I can't fathom that yeah, you know but he did it and he took you know five stones because he was prepared to kill them all yeah, you know um, you know Moses yeah, you know he parted the Red Sea all that all this stuff is through faith you know he led the Israelites out of Egypt out of faith in God you know God's promises God's faithfulness he relied on that that's what gave him the strength he couldn't talk in front of other people had to have his brother do it you know um, Let's see, you know, Abraham going to, you know, going to sacrifice his own son. I couldn't imagine doing that. I couldn't imagine killing anybody, let alone, you know, my own flesh and blood or somebody that I love and care about and that, have ra that I have raised. And especially when you, this person, you know, is promised by God to you, you know. Um, <laughs> and one of my favorites is Daniel. Uh, the amount of faith that it took to stand before Nebuchadnezzar, the most powerful man in the world, as a young eunuch, you know, a Hebrew boy that had been in doctrine with all this Babylonian principles and everything else. And, you know, here he is standing before the most powerful man in the world telling him what his dream is about or was about. You know, I couldn't imagine that. You know, and it's all because these guys, you know, are, they're, they're, they're made up the same way that we are. They had the same brain, the same organs, the same cells, everything, you know, because the only people, we're all created in the image of God. So we're no different, really. You know, we also have the ability to choose. We have the ability to love, just like they did. They chose. Um, you know, these guys, they, they were able to stand, uh, you know, with confidence before these people and to do these things because they knelt humbly before God. And that's the most important thing. It one that matter, uh, David Asherick at our uh, charge for when we graduated, uh, he said, you know, you probably won't remember half of the stuff you learned out here. And it was a lot of information. Um, <laughs> I hadn't sat in school in a long time, but my brain hurt several times trying to understand. David actually completely lost me in the book of Acts. I had no idea what was going on. He spent more time in like Galatians in the Old Testament than he did in Acts. And I was just like, man, I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, I, I had faith that, well, one day I'll understand it, you know. But we, uh, I lost my train. As I was out there, and, you know, we, I completely lost my train of thought on that one. Um, so going back to the faith, we, we all need the faith. We're all built the same way these guys are. Uh, and I think we all have that inside us. We, we we're able to do that. We're able to believe as they did. We're able to stand with confidence and, and you know, uh, before powerful men, before the world. I mean, Christians are pe persecuted all over the world today. Look, look at the TV. Hey, you know, we're not allowed to talk about God in any way, shape, or form. You know, God's over here, and then transgressions and sin is just it's up here, above everything. You know, I don't, I don't understand that. You know, and if you say you're a Christian or you believe in God, you're, you're persecuted for it. These guys were the same way. You know, it's just different. Uh, you know, they didn't walk around, uh, you know, David... Moses, Noah, none of them, they didn't walk around glowing in the dark. They didn't walk around hovering or all over the ground. They weren't anything spectacular. They were just ordinary people. Uh, 
like I said, they suffered and everything else just like we have and do. Um, you know, but yet they were chosen by God to carry out very important tasks, and that was to preach the gospel. And that's what they did because everything they were preaching back then, you know, whether they were preaching in the Old Testament and everything they did it was, was, was pointing towards Christ and towards the cross. In the New Testament, all the disciples, they were pointing back to the cross, just like we are today. Yeah, you know, everything points towards the cross and should point towards the cross and God's love. Um, we, our actions speak a lot louder than words. We, uh, you know, we can sit there and say that we're Christians, we can say that we love God, but if we don't show that, uh, you know, it's, it doesn't mean anything. Um, you know, we need to rely on God and His faithfulness to carry us through, you know, and I, you know, Deuteronomy 7, 9 to me really, you know, sets that in concrete for me. It says, uh, therefore know that the Lord your God, He is God, the faithful God who keeps His covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love Him and keep His commandments. You know, these people, these Davids and Noahs and everything else and the countless others probably that we don't know about that I'm looking forward to when we do get to heaven that we'll probably learn a lot more. Uh, you know, about all these people. Uh, you know, they relied on the faithfulness of God, and that's what we need to do today, is rely on His faithfulness. Um, so, what was the difference with all these guys and, and us? Is their relationship with God. They, you know, Jesus is the perfect example. They prayed constantly. They spent time with God. You know, they... they we're constantly in communion with Him, and especially Jesus. Every time, I mean, before He went to go get crucified, He spent time in the Garden of Gethsemane praying, asking His disciples to pray with Him, and they found Him. They, he found Him sleeping. Uh, you know, He He didn't rely on. You know, how I have a hard time relying on self. I want to rely on myself all the time until, instead of giving God, you know, control. You know, Christ in there struggled not to use His divinity to take. You know, to turn the stone into bread. You know, that was what He struggled with. That was what he was praying for strength for, and, you know. And he all, he prayed for us during all that too, you know. During all this time and this confusion, he knew he was doing that for us. He was dying for us, which is completely beyond. I just I can't even imagine that dying for somebody that I don't know, um, or you know that yeah that I don't know that I don't necessarily love. I still struggle with that. Yeah, you know, one of the hardest things for me to realize when I started going back to church was all these people that I picked up on the ambulance and everything else. God loved them just as much as He does me. You know, when before I would be judgmental, I'd be like, oh, well, you know, I've said some bad things about people. <laughs> um, and I regret that, and I hate that, you know. Um, but it's, it's the environment that you put yourself in, too. You know, your environment says a lot. You know, if you want to live in that environment, you know, you kind of tend to go towards that way. It takes actually work to be in that environment and not be, not go with the flow in the crowd. Um, you know, like I said, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, you know, he was at his lowest point. That's when Satan came to him. After 40 days of not eating, I've never eaten. I've never not eaten for that long. You know, I've never not eaten for a day, you know. I couldn't imagine the hungry people in the world, you know, like the guys were talking about earlier. Hey, you know, and that, that was another thing we did out at Rise. We fed the homeless on, uh, we did a thing called Food Not Bombs. Actually, it was a lady from the Eugene Church that would do this every Sunday. <clears throat> and out in Eugene, there are a lot of homeless people. They, I mean, they would have whole t corners of the street and city set up for like, with tents. You know, every Sunday, they would have a bus come in. Uh, they would get medical treatment. They would get haircuts. They would get their feet washed. Um, any type of medical treatment that they may need, you know, get checked out by a doctor, had a couple nurses there, and they would have people giving out food while we were there. And uh, one guy didn't like going to outreach, so that was his, his domain. He took over that, and we got students, you know, several of us to go. And I went a couple times, and there was one lady there that uh, <laughs> she said, I, I've, I've heard some blasphemous things about our about God. This lady just blew that out of the water. I've never heard a lady speak like that. I mean, it was just, you know, it was bad, you know, and here I am, you know, or in three of four of four others, uh, you know, here we are going through an evangelistic school and all we're learning is God is love. There is no way I could have looked at that lady and said, God loves you and expect her to believe it. None. 
And, you know, with the things that were coming out of her mouth, there's nothing. And, you know, I didn't know, no, none of us knew what to say. You know, and it hurt, you know, and I didn't, I, it hurt me. I'm like, man, I cannot believe she's talking like this. And I felt bad for her. Uh, I wasn't used to that feeling either. <laughs> a couple of years ago, you asked me that, I'd be like, eh, it wouldn't faze me a bit. Um, but it, it, it bothered me. You know, I felt, uh, you know, bad for the lady. She was talking about how, you know, she's homeless. She was, it was right when it started to get really cold. She's talking about how she was, and she's yelling this, you know, uh, talking about, uh, you know, how she had been raped, how she was going to freeze to death tonight, how, uh, you know, all this bad stuff had happened to her. How can she sit there and think that God is love? With all this stuff, I mean, she has a horrible picture of God. You know, we can pray. I mean, I've prayed for her numerous times. Um, because God wants her in heaven. Just like he does me, just like he does you, just like he does everybody. That lady right there who said the most blasphemous things I ever heard, he, he, I've ever heard, he loves her just as much as he does me. And, I, I, and you know, he, he goes after that one lost sheep and leaves the other 99 behind. I go, go get her. You know, I'm, I'm you know... I'll stay back here, God, you can go get her, yeah, you know, because I, this lady, she's, I, I couldn't imagine the pain that she's felt, you know, and she's hungry on top of all that. So I, I remember I was sitting there, and no, none of us said anything, you know, and, and I'm kind of used to hearing some, you know, blasphemous things, you know. I mean, I've seen, I've seen a lot of stuff at work and other places that I kind of understand how stuff goes sometimes. But this lady surprised me. Anyway, the others, they were kind of, they weren't <laughs> real sure how to take it. But uh, like I said actions. I, there was nothing. I couldn't think of anything to do. But we had food left over, and I remember seeing her over there sitting. She was sitting on a bench, and she was crying, and she was talking to uh, one of the nurses there. And I, I mean, I didn't know what else to do. But I just went up and gave her another, you know, little carton of food. You know, I didn't say anything. God bless you. I couldn't say that. I, you know, if I would have said that, I think it would have done more. Even though I wanted to, I really, really wanted to. I think it would have done more harm than good. And I really feel these guys that are going out and you know, feeding the, the the homeless and feeding, you know, hungry people. We really, really need to support them because that's, that's it's all over. It's everywhere. I've never seen it like I saw it there. It was unbelievable. These people would come from all over, over all over the city. Um, you know, dirty fingernails, just, I mean, you look like I hadn't bathed in a week. You know, you feel bad. You know, it's just amazing. God didn't intend people to do it that way. You know, that's not his intention. That's what sin has done to this world. You know, um, and it's terrible, you know, but we really need to support, you know, those guys doing that ministry. You know, I really admire them for doing that, you know, and I appreciate that, you know. Um, so, like I said, going back to a story where, you know, where I didn't have any faith and where I struggled with faith, it was, uh, it was about the beginning of 2006. I had just been released as a lead paramedic to work on a truck with anybody, which means basically I was responsible for everything on that ambulance. Um, I was nowhere near following Christ. I mean, I could, I don't even remember how many times I'd prayed, uh, none, I could, you know. Uh, I was going to help out another county that day down in uh, Rockingham in Richmond County. Uh, on my way to work that morning, you know, I was nervous because I knew, you know, you can get some, Richmond County stays busy with ambulance calls. I mean, you get some significant calls down there. And here I am, brand new. I'm nervous. Uh, so I said a prayer. Just I don't even remember what I said. Uh, you know, a short prayer. You know, God, don't let me do anything stupid today. Don't let me hurt anybody. You know, something to that effect. Got to work. I started going over my cardiac protocols, which is basically step by step. You know what to do, and if this happens, if that happens, you know, we're supposed to, we have them memorized, but it's reference. Uh, so we get this. I was working with a basic that day. I'd maybe met him once before. Uh, we got dispatch. I'm not even sure what it was, whether it was chest pain or altered level of consciousness. Anyway, we got out there, and you know, walk into the house. Uh, there's a lady in her mid 40s laying on the floor in her bedroom. Her husband's standing there. She's pale. Confused, doesn't know where she's at, doesn't know what's going on. So I'm like, okay. So I started going down the checklist in my mind. I uh, check her blood sugar is fine. She's got a pulse, which means, you know, she sh should have a decent blood pressure. She has a radial pulse. And um, so, I'm, you know, all this stuff is going through my mind. Like, well, I don't, you know, she's not had a stroke and everything else. So I'm starting to 
you know, trying to figure out what's going on. Well, my partner sits and says, well, I'm going to go get the stretcher because we're kind of at a standstill. And I was like, okay, well, I'll put the monitor on her while you're doing that. So I hooked up the monitor and I uh, looked at it and then I, you know, basically did a double take and she was in what's called VTAC, you know, and I know there's a lot of medical people here today. You know, Missy's one, uh, my wife, Phyllis, you know, maybe some others, Joe, you've been around medical facilities. Um, this basically, this rhythm, you know, you're in VTAC, then you're what's in VFib and then you're, in, you're dead after that. So this is the second to last rhythm before you're dead, basically. You can either have a pulse or not have a pulse with this. Um, I had never seen this rhythm. I had had 500 some odd hours of clinical time between the hospitals and ambulance. I'd never seen it. Uh, you know, I knew what to do, <laughs> but I hoped, but I'd never seen this treated before, you know, so I got a little nervous, uh, you know, um, to the point I was asking my basic partner, which I was like, you know, I decided technically I should have cardioverted her which is basically, you've seen that on TV where they basically was well, a little bit different than fibrillation, but you shock them in a certain part of their heart uh, rhythm. And it's supposed to reset their heart, basically like an electronic piece of equipment, you hit the reset button, same concept. It wipes everything out and hopefully it starts back over the way it should. Uh, so I was kind of torn with what to do, but then you know, you have to, you just basically you have to make a decision. You know, you don't have a lot of time. So I didn't want to do that, so, so well, I'll fix it excuse me, with some medicine. So by the time that I decided all that, I had I decided to give lidocaine, which I'd never seen given before. It's basically the same stuff they can, you know, numb you up with when uh, you get stitches. Uh, I had an IV start and then the medicine in, and it was all like three minutes. Um, didn't know if it was going to work, didn't know what to do. And, you know, I was just like kind of waiting because, you know, I've never seen it, didn't know anything about it. Uh, I was just doing what the book told me to do. And I called for the supervisor, supervisor got there, because I was really expecting this lady to go into cardiac arrest in any minute. And as we went to lift her up, uh, she went in to what, <laughs> went into V-fib, and I'm like, oh man, she, you know, here we go. And then she just, a little bit of run of V-fib, and then right back into a sinus tack, which is a fast, normal rhythm. I think, you know, and at that point, I think the color came back to my face because the color came back to her. She pinked up. Uh, you know, we got her on the stretcher, put her in the ambulance. Did some more tests. Anyway, it showed that she was having a heart attack. We took her to the hospital. We took her to another hospital after that um, where they went in a cath, put in a catheter to see if she was actually having a heart attack. Uh, you know, I usually don't find out what happens to people after the fact, but this lady ended up having a cocaine-induced MI, which is a cocaine-induced heart attack. Uh, she didn't have a blockage. She just, you know, husband, if her husband would have told us that, you know, we asked these questions, what would have done, or what, what was going on, what happened, you know, it would have helped some. But I hope she's still alive. I don't know. It's one of those things. It's kind of like Denise. I have no idea what's going on with her out in Oregon right now. And, you know, I have no idea where this lady is. I hope she stopped using cocaine because she almost died. Uh, you know, and... I tell you that story because of, of a prayer that was said that morning, um, a prayer said in faith. Uh, you know, I, I found this quote, you know, and it says, faith is not without worry or care, but faith is fear that has said a prayer. And that was an unknown author. Um, I, I didn't even realize it until after the fact of what had happened as far as God had answered my prayer. I think he answered the lady's prayer more than he did mine because he kept her safe. And then I didn't realize it until, you know, was this in 06? It was six, eight years later. That's when I realized that he had answered my prayer that day. Uh, so, you know, be patient. You know, just because you're praying now, you know, doesn't mean that God's not answering. He's always answering prayers. Always. Uh, you know, and sometimes it's just being patient. You know, you'll realize it years from now. Uh, I was telling Keelan that yesterday, you know, just be patient, you know, you may not see it now, but just, you know, be patient. I have to tell myself that too, you know, I mean, they say that the majority of the, the message from the speaker is actually for the speaker. Yeah, this is this for me too, you know, because I've struggled with it, especially this week. Um, so I'm thankful that he answered that prayer that day for that lady, you know, uh, helped me to help her. You know, um, and I've had a lot of other calls since then. That was just the one that really sticks out in my head. Uh, I'm thankful that he's allowed me to see the humanity in people again. 
instead of just looking at people as basically like their machine that needs to be fixed. Because that's the point I got to. I was just like, and nothing, I mean, I was a medical examiner. I'd go on these calls. Nothing would, I'd see people crying, see people just, you know, in pain. And it would just, it affected me more looking back on it, you know, now than what I realized then, or than what I realized then. Um, I would get angry a lot. My, my, my fuse was short. <laughs> you know, and I didn't realize that's what it was, but I really honestly think that's what it was, is just dealing with that stuff every day and, you know, or a lot, uh, you know, and I couldn't imagine, you know, other people have seen a lot more than me. I've never seen it all. Uh, I'm thankful that God allowed me to realize that, you know. Uh, my wife, she puts up with stuff in the ER that I couldn't imagine having to deal with. And, you know, Missy working in with cancer patients, I couldn't imagine, you know, having to deal with that, you know, we need to keep these people in our prayers on all these people, you know, because they deal with a lot, a lot of, you know, comes with that. Um, so <laughs> that, I was very thankful that that hit me, that I'm like, wow, you know, God answered my prayer back then, even when I was nowhere near following him. I mean, I, you know, I was like the complete opposite, and, you know, I was drinking all the time. <laughs> you know, just, I mean, I was just, you know, living in a, you know, I had two or three roommates at the time. You know, if I wasn't at work, we were drinking, you know. Um, you know, and I thought, oh, well, I'm not that bad, man. Looking back on it, yeah, I was. Yeah, you know, uh, it's amazing what, you know, when you grab the mirror that God puts in front of you and you hold it up to your own face and you look at it, it's amazing what you'll see. You know, once you start reading his word, you know, you'll, you know, like I said, I'm the chief sinner. You know, I struggle with it every day. And, you know, people, well, you went to a four-month evangelism school. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that even made it almost more difficult in a way. I struggled out there, you know, a lot more than I struggled at home. I wish we could all sit there. And when we first started going back to Christ, everything was like, you know, a lot easier. Um, but, or seemed to be. But I'm thankful for those uh, trials. I'm thankful for those troubles because, and you know, being able to see it and actually hurt because you know God's there. Because before, when I didn't have God, that hurt wasn't there. And, you know, when I see these people in pain and everything else, I wouldn't have any compassion for them whatsoever. Um, you know, one thing they said about my sermon was, uh, you know, they liked the content of it. The appeal wasn't that great, which I'm still not that great with appeals. But you know, my appeal today is that. You know, no matter what you're doing, you can always pray. Even if it's just it's just a little prayer said in faith can actually change somebody's life. And you may not realize it until eight years later, but that, that little prayer I said that morning, I just I, out of just simple faith, and I didn't even know I, that's what it was, but that's what it was. It was said out of faith. It changed that lady's life that day. You know, because um, he didn't let me do anything stupid <laughs> and hurt her. Uh, you know, it... It really had a profound effect on me once I realized that, you know. So I, I did all this in 10 minutes out there, uh, which was kind of difficult, actually. Um, but they say my appeal wasn't that great, so and that's okay. I'm not going to ask everybody to come forward and raise their hands and all this stuff. Just know that you can pray in faith and, and, and remember God's faithfulness in us. Uh, you know, He loves us. Uh, you know, He has faith in us. You know, our job is to go out and tell about Him, tell about His love for us, and that's what we're supposed to do, and, you know, and especially through our actions, and everything should point back towards Him and His sacrifice. Um, you know, in closing, uh, you know, I want to read John 15, 7, and 8, and, you know, it kind of goes along with the whole, you know, faith and trusting in God, and then God's faithfulness. Uh, says, if you ab abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. He answered my prayer that day, and it's, you know, he answered my prayer that day, you know, that morning, you know, and then all this time later, you know, he helped me realize what it was, and, you know, he was glorified that day, you know. Um, so I would definitely say that, you know, his fruit was shown that day. He, he kept his promises, even when I was very far away. All right. Mm -hmm.